glorify your name glorify your name glorify your name in all the earth for you are worthy worthy of majesty worthy of dominion worthy of power worthy of riches worthy of all authority worthy of praise today glorify thy name in all the earth be magnified in this place my soul doth magnify you my soul doth make her boast in you for you and you alone are my salvation you're my strength my grace my everything I want to thank you that when I woke up this morning I was in my right mind had the activity of my limbs had a reasonable portion of health and strength had food to eat and clothes to wear had a roof over my head had transportation name written in the Lamb's book of life thank you for being a mighty God a prayer answering God a merciful God and I want to thank you for yet another week that you kept me from some dangers I could see some I could not but you've been gracious as we pray today we would pray for our country confusion that seems to reign at various levels let your spirit have the right of way you said if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then would I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal the land would you heal America as we stand in the gap for our country I love there's some folks in here who might be bound by something we proclaim freedom and deliverance in this place in the name of Jesus and today as we preach speak to our hearts about the deliverance that there is in your son Jesus Christ and that there is wrapped up in Christmas now take complete control of everything that goes on in this place thank you for one service already at 8 o'clock now would you manifest yourself again to this crowd and say what you want to say to us and we will be careful to give your name the praise the glory the honor the majesty the dominion the power all in the name of jesus if you know him and you're not ashamed go ahead and say praise god, praise god. and amen so glad you're here go ahead and be seated i'm glad that uh, i'm saved today and here christmas is certainly not about commercialism in this series it is my contention that christmas is really not primarily about jesus saving us I know we are Americans and we believe that God does everything for us. And so we are still caught up in the perspective of God. He sent Jesus to say, me, 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 me. Uh, not us, not the world, but me. And so we've been using a scripture, uh, 1 John 3 and 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. It's in your notes. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. The Son of God appeared at Bethlehem for the purpose of destroying the works of the devil. Now, I know I'm kind of messed up. I mean, I had to preach this in the first service, and I, I don't know why God gives me this stuff to preach. I, I, you know, I want to preach about reindeer, Rudolph, and, and, and other stuff, but I got to preach what's in the Bible, so forgive me. I know people think Christmas is about something else, but... Uh, we're going to learn from a biblical perspective what it's about. So today I'm going to read a whole lot of scripture. You can get caught up on your scripture reading. Uh, I'm sure this is new for some of you. For some of you it shouldn't be too new because I've done Christmas series on Cosmic Christmas before. But coming out a little bit different this particular time. So I'm going to start right off reading the word of God. Just get it down inside of us. Matthew 1, 18 is about all we ever know about Christmas. So we're going to start there and then we'll branch our way out. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on as follows when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Jesus before they came together. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. 
and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. All right, you can sit down. You don't have to stand up no more unless, unless the Holy Spirit tells you to stand up. Then you can. Because we're going to read a lot of scripture. You'll be up and down like a jumping jack. There is no doubt. This is the scripture that was normally read. And there's no doubt that Jesus came to save people from their sins. But there is another reason, I think, that and purpose that may be practically and theologically prior to saving us from our sins. And that purpose is to destroy the works of the devil. The verse that states this priority is seen in the story of a demonized man. Matthew 12, 22, don't stand up no more. Then a demonized man who was blind and, and mute was brought to Jesus. And he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. And all the crowds were amazed. And they were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, this is in your notes. They said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand so if Satan cast out Satan he's divided against himself how then will his kingdom stand if I by Beelzebub cast out demon by whom do your sons cast them out for this reason they will be your judges but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God then the kingdom of God has come to you or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house the translation demon possessed is unfortunate because that's really not the sense in the Greek a better translation would be demonized no one is eternal totally demon possessed as no one is going to be totally filled with the spirit uh, the human will is involved at some level yet the man is demonized in a moment I will establish the fact that Jesus continually encountered demons through his ministry but on this occasion Jesus healed a demonized man who was blind and mute the crowds were amazed men began to believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy concerning uh, a man coming through the line of King David please don't miss the fact that the crowds were wondering if he was the son of David because he was casting out demons. So they believe that casting out demons is characteristic of the Messiah who is in the line of King David. So casting out demons, I'm trying to help somebody here. Casting out demons has got something to do with Jesus. Now, you're trying to figure out how the babe was born in the manger whether it was really a manger or was it a stable or what was it. And you've missed the perspective of why Jesus came theologically and practically before he gets to save us. The Pharisees attempted to dissuade the crowd from believing in Jesus by suggesting that he was casting out demons by the ruler of demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus defends his action. And in his defense, we gain valuable information about the warfare between him and Satan. Jesus explained, any kingdom that's divided against itself is laid waste. In addition, he reasons that if Satan cast out Satan, then he's divided against himself. How can his kingdom stand? Consequently, if he cast out demons by the ruler of demons, then who are your sons casting them out by? Your own sons will be your judges one day. And as he continues to defend his actions, he moves beyond the immediate situation and he starts talking about the kingdom. Now, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble today, so I'm trying to get into this quick so I can get in and I can run and get, get out of here because I don't want anybody throwing rocks and stuff at me because it's going to be tough today. Because all you think about is being saved, being saved by saved. So Jesus stood up and he said, listen, I want to talk to you all about being saved. I want you to come down here, give me your hand, give God your heart. You should be lost. That's not what he says. He preaches about the kingdom over and over and over again. And he states here, if I cast out demons by the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God has come to you. That's not what you would say. You would say, if I get a whole lot of people to come to church, then the kingdom of God has come. If I can get more people to be saved, then the kingdom of God has come. 
We have a whole lot of stuff we would put in there, but it ain't got nothing to do with demons. But he said, if you want to know if the kingdom has arrived, demons got to be cast out. The kingdom of God was manifested. Consequently, the kingdom of God is not only manifested in saving people, that's one way, but casting out demons by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, don't worry, I'm not expecting many amens or claps today. Because I'm not talking about what you want to talk about. I'm talking about how we can know what Christmas is really all about. His last point reveals why he has to destroy the works of the devil, and this is why it's, pro it's pro practically and theologically prior. He asks the question, and then he answers the question, how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And he answers the question because he knows some folks are going to get it wrong. He said he can. He's got to first bind the strong man, and then he simply jumps and said, then he will plunder his house. The strong man is the ruler of the demons, Satan. Jesus said, I got to bind the strong man. Perhaps he's talking about this blind man so I can get this blind and mute man out from under the bondage of the devil. And the only way I can get him out from the bondage of the devil is I got to bind and plunder the strong man. Ain't nobody talking about that today because we think we're going to counsel everybody out of stuff. Counsel, counsel, counsel. I don't have any problem with counseling. I think it's important. And we all, a lot of us need counseling. But the problem is, after you get through counseling, there's some demonic stuff going on that if you don't know how to deal with it, you'll still be bound. Have anybody figured out yet that your eating problems and the fact that they're so strong that you can't seem to break them could have a demonic element? Have you figured out yet that... That the fact that you just go down there and spend all your money and you ain't got no money. There might be something demonic. Have you figured out yet that alcohol might have a demonic element? Have you figured out yet that pornography might have a demonic element? Have you figured out yet that adultery and fornication might have a demonic element? That there might be something going on that's demonic, that's holding people? No. No. And so from a, from, a, from a theological perspective and a practical perspective, sometimes you got to bind the strong man before you can deliver us from our sin. Christmas is about destroying the works of the devil. What I'm preaching about right now is oxymoronic, counterintuitive. In America, this is almost impossible to see how these demons manifest themselves. So what I'm going to do today is real crazy. I'm, I'm half crazy anyway. I'm going to do a survey, a brief survey of only the gospel of Matthew. And I want you to see how many times demons encounter Jesus. And then we want to talk about that. All right? Jesus' ministry begins with an encounter with the devil. It does not begin with him preaching. It does not begin with his consecration. It, does not begin, it begins with an encounter with the devil. Matthew 4, 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Lord might lead you, but the, de the Lord ain't tempting you. It's the devil tempting you. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he, then he became hungry. For, for real? It took 40 days and 40 nights? This is America. Y'all be y'all hungry after 40 minutes. You grazing and you just got started. You already grazing. It's only 9 o'clock and you're ready to get something else to eat. And after the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, it's written, man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into a holy city and had him stand on a pinnacle on the temple and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil knows the Bible too. Not just you. So when the devil tries to get you off from trusting God by giving you scripture, you need to be able to say, and it also says, but you need to be in the Bible for that. Okay, I got to go on. That's not my subject. Again, the devil took him into a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Now, Jesus doesn't argue with him. He doesn't say, you don't, they don't belong to you. You don't have the kingdom. Evidently, he must have them. Somehow he's, a, he's acquired the kingdoms of the world. Perhaps when Adam and Eve, Eve sinned, they lost title to it. I don't know how. Somehow he's got them. So the devil said, look, I'm not going to have no conversation with you about that. Go. 
I don't know where you're going, but you got to get up out of here. Go, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Did you get it? Jesus' ministry begins with an encounter with the devil, the tempter. In this case, the devil is personal. Now, I don't have time to do all of this because I'm creating a theology, and I can't do it for the whole Bible because I'm only using four sermons. But do you understand that in the Old Testament, the Bible, the devil is not personal. The word that is used in Hebrew is hasetan. It is an enemy, some kind of enemy. He's nondescript. He's not personal. You get to the New Testament, Jesus is in Matthew, and now the devil himself is standing there. I'm telling you, and last week we talked about how that came to be. So he interacts with Jesus by questioning him and provoking him to take action that he would portray his trust in God. It's really not about your little sin that the devil wants to get you all messed up in. It's not your little sin. It's that the fact that you don't trust God. And the devil's trying to get you off so that you don't trust him. You see, you're over there com com complaining and telling God and confessing that you drank five Pepsis for, 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 for breakfast last yesterday. And it ain't the fact, that little thing, the fact that you drank five Pepsis is not your problem. The fact is you didn't trust God, and therefore you drank five Pepsis because you was in pain. The problem is you're not trusting God with the stuff that, is anybody in here? So the problem is that the devil's going to be doing some stuff to provoke you and question you to not trust God. The devil's operating in all kinds of ways. Let's take our survey. Y'all ready to go? The crowds brought demoniacs to Jesus, and he healed them. Matthew 4, 24. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and then they brought to him all who were ill, those who were suffering with various diseases and pain, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. The, 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 the people expect Jesus to be able to deal with all manner of suffering, including demoniacs. That's not our expectation. Why? Because this is America. In America, we believe all problems are psychological, medical, physical, but they are not spiritual. I'm here to alert you that there's some demonized stuff going on. I thank God for my mother and for my father, particularly my mother, because she understood there was some demonized stuff going on, and she dealt with it at a demonized level. You can't always deal with folks and reason out of them what the devil done put in them. I'm not getting no help up in here. This is America. I'm going to show you as we go through here. You're going to ask yourself a question, how did you miss this? Because you read the Bible and you don't read any of this. You read with American eyes. So all you see is Jesus saving, Jesus saving. And one time hardly he ever says anything about, I want you to come down here. I'm getting ready to save you. He's trying to deliver people. Watch, let's go. Matthew 8, 28. And when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him, and they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by their way. I'm just going to stop. I'm not going to go into it. You, you think the violence that's going on in America doesn't have a demonic element to it? You think people can go out and kill 50, 60, 100 people, and that the demons are nowhere involved? Give no thought to it. You know, we, we on TV, I wonder what his psychological profile was. I don't know what his psychological profile is, but I know what his spiritual profile is. Some demons are loose somewhere. Here it says they were so violent you couldn't even pass that way. And they cried out saying, what business do we have? with each other, son of God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. And the demons began to entreat him, saying, if you are going to cast us out, and then send us in this herd of swine. Stop for a minute. God, Jesus is so powerful that the demons are asking him where they can go. Now, we over here, the devil got us beat, buffaloed, and everything else. Over here, they're asking Jesus, if you're going to cast us out, since you got all this power, please let us go into this wine. Now, I'm, I did everything I could to ask the Lord to help me so I didn't tell this joke because I don't want to mess up my sermon. It's real serious. But this is the first place where we have devil ham. Don't tell. I'm, I'm sorry. Let's go. So here, what happens is, 
I, I said I wasn't going to do that. The devil got the best of me. So, what does he say? The demons began to entreat him. And he said to them, go. And they came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water. The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniac. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they said, we're so glad you are here. Now you can save us. That's not what it said? What did it say? They implored him, get up out of here. Two demoniacs confront Jesus. Remember, they are not demon-possessed. They are demonized. I know we talk about demon possession. That's inaccurate. Nobody's fully possessed because you still have a human will. Like you're not fully controlled by the Holy Spirit because you still have a human will. But you're influenced like in Matthew or Ephesians 5.18, the influence of alcohol. Demons meet and confront Jesus. Why? Why do demons keep confronting him? It's not, it's not that hard. It's a part of their mission. It's warfare. Jesus has come to establish an outpost in the enemy territory. He is the prince and power of the air. Every nation, every kingdom, every principality, every power is under his aegis. Here comes Jesus. I'm going to set up a kingdom, an outpost in your territory. And the devil says what? No, you ain't. Not up in here. So he casts them out and he sends them into a herd of swine who perish. And they come back and say, you're going to have to leave up out of here. Just so you understand, those of you who are doing real ministry, that if you start doing what God really wants you to do, people will want you to leave. You think they won't be come back and pat you on the back and be happy about it? They're not going to be happy about it. Why? Number one, it's economic. Uh, all that ham and all them chitlins ran down and ran into the sea. We losing money here. Maybe you don't understand. We losing money. Number two, it's superstitious. They don't understand what's going on. How can he have this power? What's happening? Are y'all with me today? What am I talking about? I don't know. Christmas. Let's go with the survey. Y'all ready to go? Matthew 9, 32. And as they were going out, a mute demon-possessed man was brought in. And the demon was cast out. The mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. And they were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he cast out demons by the ruler of demons. Here come another demonized man. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I know I get kind of deep sometimes, but y'all can hang with me. Remember what I teach you. Everything Bishop knows, I can know too. I'm just going to give you a little that the Holy Ghost help you. You'll understand it. Now, that's the question. Are there more demonized people in Jesus' day than in our day? Or are we less sensitized to this whole middle world of rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness? I believe that the tremendous increase in our population plus the conditions of America, there are many more demonized people in America than there are in the provinces of Judea, Galilee, and Perea. But these demons are riled up because their, their, their adversary, Jesus of Nazareth, is attempting to establish an outpost of the kingdom in their territory. At work, demons ought to be riled up. Nobody bothering you at work because you're not a threat. If you are a threat at work, setting up kingdom outposts where you work, the devil is coming to see you. If you are doing what God has called you to do on your job, in the neighborhood, any place, the devil will be coming to see you. Now, you say, he don't never bother me. That's because you're on his side. No need to bother people who he already got. I might have to run up here in a minute. Secondarily, the reason that the devil does not use outright uh, demonization over people today is it's no longer strategy of the devil to do visible warfare against God. He now throws a rock and hides his hand because it's more effective to use prosperity and distraction than it is overt warfare. Do you know if a demon came to you, what that would do to most Americans? It would send them to God. In this territory, in the Bible, it has a different impact. On us, 
if you if you left, if you go home tonight and you in your bedroom and a demon walks in. The church answering service would have 50 messages from you by tomorrow. Can, is Bishop in? Can somebody come over here? I need somebody to lay hands on. I, uh, there's some demons over here in my Bring the oil with you. It would drive you to Jesus. The devil knows better than to do that in America. He gives you prosperity. Prosperity will kill all your Christianity. You're too rich, you got too many cars, you got too much stuff to come to church or to be worried about Jesus. Or distraction. He'll just distract you with this, that, the other thing. You're just so distracted that it takes you out of the game. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil by establishing his kingdom on earth. Christmas but the coming of Jesus into the world to destroy the works of the devil and to establish a foothold of his kingdom in this world. Why can't we see it? Why don't we see it? How can we read the Bible over and over and miss it? Because we're Americans. And we're reading through American eyes, not through the eyes of the people to whom it was written. So we read it and skip right through these things and hardly ever see the devil at all. As a matter of fact, you need to get your eyes opened up because you can't discern him around you either right now. You can't see the devil. You think everything is people. They're people. You know what she said to me. But don't you think the devil got something to do with that? The one prophet said, look, Lord, open their eyes. Because they, they can't see what's going on. They said, oh, we're in trouble. I looked at this morning. I picked up the Beacon Journal, and there's enemies all around. I want you to know. They said, but you haven't read the, 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 the thing from heaven. Because if you've seen the paper from heaven, you'd be able to see that there's more with us than there are than with them. They said, I can't see it. Where is it at? He said, Lord, open his eyes. And he opened his eyes. And he said, the hills are full of chariots and angels of fire. That around you, whether you understand it or not, God, because you are his child, has placed certain emissary to protect you and to watch out for you, and you don't even know it. Sometimes when the devil's trying to do something to you, God has already done something and opened up a door and blocked the devil so he can't do with you what he wants to do to you. How many times have I been driving down the street, lose control of the car, and God or something will grab the car, move it over, send it, and here I am, I, nothing done happened to me. How many times have doors been opened that I couldn't understand? But I forgot, y'all don't believe in angels. Y'all don't believe in demons. You don't believe in any of this. That's the reason why we all do the things that we do. Let's go on, because uh, I'm about tired of messing with you today. Matthew 10 and 1. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. I want you to notice that crowds keep gathering because people keep getting healed. The reason we can't gather no crowd is because let's go on let's go on he, he called his disciples he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out so it's not just Jesus ministry by himself but he gives the ministry to the disciples and their ministry entails combating unclean spirits how do we miss it how do we summarize Christ's ministry as only simply being to save us from our sins? How do we miss the fact that Christ's ministry included the ministry of a disciple, which includes the authority over unclean spirits? How do we miss it? So therefore, we end up trapped and in bondage because we don't know the authority that we have in Jesus. If you understood the authority, you would be able to step forward And get some deliverance and some freedom. All right, I got to go. I can't, I can't stay all day. I want you to come back next Sunday. Remember, this may seem long, but this is a brief survey of demonic activity in the ministry of Jesus only in the book of Matthew. Not Mark, not Luke, not John, not the epistles, not Romans, not, not, not over into Revelation. Only a few scriptures out of Matthew. I'm just asking you, how'd you miss it? Matthew 10 and 5. Are y'all ready? The 12 
these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles. and Do not enter any city of the Samaritans. But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, everybody who wants to be saved, come down to the altar. Everybody who wants to be saved, give me your hand, but give God your heart. Everybody that wants to be saved, pray this prayer after me. No, that's not what he said. Those may be all good. They may be part of the way we do church. But that's not what Jesus said. What Jesus said is go and preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. And where is he near? Because the king was standing right there. The kingdom of heaven has come close to you. Every place you go, I'm going to teach you when I break down this dichotomy between Sunday worship and Monday work that ends up with you over there on the job acting like a secular person rather than a being a part of the kingdom and helping people understand kingdom realities in everything you do. So what we got is this secular, sacred divide where we got people coming to church, worshiping, falling out, speaking in tongues, going to work on Monday and acting like hellions, and we're trying to figure out what's going on, a, a, a line of demarcation between what's happening in the church on what on Sunday and what happens in work on Monday that the same God who's knocking you out and causing you to speak in tongue will cause you not to steal at work on Monday I'm in trouble now ain't I the same God that allows you to come up and prophesy and do all that will allow you to drive the speed limit on Monday there is no dichotomy between Sunday and Monday. And if you're at work and your job is messed up, you don't know you're called over there, you don't know you're the kingdom over there, I'm here to let you know that you ought to be using your platform over there. You don't have to preach, just live right. If you live right, folks will see it. And they'll be asking questions. What are you doing right now? How come you don't have a drink like me? How come you're not stealing like I am? How come you're not depressed like I am? And there you got a, a, a door wide open to drive the gospel into. I'm trying to get up out of here. Preach. Saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You got the church gathered and you got the church scattered. All we want to do is the church gathered. Let's come and gather, 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 preach, sing, 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 gather, some, gather. No, the church got to be scattered in all of the world so that the gospel is having impact everywhere. Heal the sick. We wouldn't have no place to put people if we was what? Healing the sick. Raise the dead. I ain't got to raise but one dead person over here. All the Akron will know it. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. What are we supposed to be given? Healing. New life. Cleansing. Deliverance from demons. What do you think people need right now? They need every bit of that. And I'm going to come back, and for Martin Luther King Sunday and for a Black History Month, I'm going to preach Jesus and politics. I'm going to help you understand how political Jesus was without being partisan. That you ought to have all kinds of... The problem is we want a political solution to a spiritual problem, and that when you go over there in the sp political world and you apply a spiritual antidote, you're going to get something better than what you thought you are going to get by just a simple political answer. Nothing wrong with politics. You're going to be involved in politics, but let's do it from a kingdom perspective. Oh, oh, Jesus. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Why? Because I'm, I've split them. So that I could be one half on here and something else over here. I'm saved today. But if you say the wrong thing to me, I'll cut you tomorrow. It's Monday. Sunday's over. People say that all the time. I mean, you know, uh, did you steal that? Uh, this is Monday. What that got to do with it? Sunday's over. No, Sunday's every day for a Christian. Worship is every day for a Christian. Let's do one more. 
and now get on out your way. One final verse, Matthew 17, 14. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic. I knew that was going to relate. Some people are going to be able to relate right there. He's a lunatic. And he's very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples. And they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving perverted generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Jesus did battle with a demon to cure a man's son. Now, let's go back for a moment so I can get out of this. You don't even need a modern translation for that. A lot of y'all know your children is crazy. They making all kind of decisions, they doing all kinds of stuff, and you wonder, wow, wow. When they were young, they were on your knee. Now that they are old, they are on your heart. When they were young, making decisions about who they was going to play with, what toys they going to take to the, the school, and all that stuff, that was one thing. Now that they make life decisions... We're wondering what's going on. I'm just going to go ahead and say so. Some of y'all won't say it. Y'all looking at me crazy. You know your kids is crazy. Their mom and daddy's crazy. That's why they're crazy. They ain't got it from you. And they are, look, the, the, I'm telling you what the man said. The man came. I didn't say this. He said it to Jesus. He said, my son's a lunatic. There's something wrong with the boy. Can you help him out? I brought him to the church people. They couldn't help. Jesus said, my God, how long I got to put up with y'all? Don't you understand what's going on here? The boy comes, he brings the boy, he says, bring him over. He bring him over here. He don't ask no question. He don't have no long discussion. He, don't that. he just says, go. I rebuke you, demon. And the demon comes out of the boy, and he's cured at once. I got to preach you just a little bit, and I'm done. Don't you understand that your children, some of them need the devil cast out of them, that the problem that they got is not simply a psychological problem, not simply an emotional problem, but that the devil has created a, 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 a pathway into their life, a stronghold in their life, and got a hold on them, and that the bondages must be broken, I didn't have that problem when I was growing up because when I became a teenager and I decided I didn't want to be saved no more. I had been saved all my life. I got saved when I was eight years old. I grew up in the church. I went everywhere with my mother. We went to places. We went to services. We did all kinds of stuff. I got to be about 14. I said, Mom, I think I'm done. I started acting real crazy. She started rebuking the devil like it was going out of style. You foul demon, you come out of this boy. You going to leave, you going to let go of my son. I'm saying. What are you doing? Cuz she knew something I didn't know. That the devil will come in and create a place inside of you, a tapas, and get some territory. And begin to operate and the bondages must be broken by prayer and fasting and, and, and laying your hands on people. Yes, get some counseling. But in the meantime, I'm going to pull this oil on your head. And when I get through with you, God is going to deliver you. You are not going to be taken over by no demonic spirit in this house. This is God's house. And you're going to live right as long as you live here. And if you don't, I'm going to pray to the holy hound of heaven chase you to the end of the earth. Because God is going to do something in your life. I got plans for you. And God's got plans for you. And you are not going to take them plans and throw them away. I can't hear nobody right now. 
you got to speak some life into your children. You got to speak some life into them. You got to tell them, no, I, I, no I, I got better than that plan for you. I prayed a long time for your soul. I've been praying for you since you were born. You're not about to go out here and act like that. God is going to do something in your life. I bind the devil that's all over you right now. I may not can handle you, but I know somebody who can. His name is Jesus, and he will. So that's why we got the problem we got now, because we think it's all counseling, all whatever, and no prayer. No power. Sometimes you got to let the devil know he don't have that type of power. You got to establish your territory and let him know that by the blood of Jesus and by the power of my testimony, I claim a victory for Jesus Christ. I've lived long enough to see folks turn their back on God and come back later. I've lived long enough to see people make foolish decisions and God come back and turn it around and work it out. The warfare is so continual, why can't we see it? It's hidden in plain sight. But I'm trying to create new eyes in you so you can begin to discern the devil. And when you can, then you can stop fighting flesh and blood. It's not flesh and blood. Principalities, powers, wickedness in high places demons territorial demons there's all kinds of warfare going on and you need to be able to see what your spiritual eyes real quick then then with your eyes now you're getting a new set of eyes go ahead and pick up your glasses and put them on put on your biblical glasses all right go ahead put them on can you see now that that, that spiritual warfare is what christmas is all about can you see yet how the devil use, uses commercialization to wreck your whole spirit and take you away from God? Can't you see it yet? From Black Friday all the way to Christmas, your spirit is inundated with all kinds of commercials and this about this and that to get you off. Have you figured it out yet? Have you figured out yet that every holiday, holiday blues come, you don't know what it is, you don't know how you got down, you don't know why you down, but all of a sudden you down. Haven't you figured out yet that the devil might be trying to do something that caused you to be messed up so that you can't get no joy in the very season of joy? I'm not getting no amen. <laughs> Haven't you figured out yet that the devil will do anything he can to distract you from the announcement and the anticipation of the defeat of the devil by a baby named Jesus who would become the Lamb of God who would one day destroy the works of the devil through the mystical power of love. It's about destroying the works of the devil so that his kingdom may come and his will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. I pray today, God, open your eyes and you see the reality of Christmas. Now is the day of salvation. Come to Jesus now. If you don't know him, I want you to know him. I want you to know that from the time you walked in here, the devil's been messing with you. He'll try to keep you from getting the word of God and being saved. He'll use weather, he'll use people beside you, he'll use seats, he'll use temperature, he'll use anything he can to keep you from deliverance that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here that you might be delivered. And your primary deliverance is in salvation. If you want to know him, just say, Lord, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life, save me, make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and giving me eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. If you prayed that in a minute, I'm so excited for you right now because the devil no longer has bondage and power over you. You are free. 
you can stand and walk down and they will meet you down here need a church home we want to give you the opportunity to do that but I'm praying for more power I'm praying for more discernment I'm tired of being beat up by the devil I want some victory I want to walk on top sometime I want to be an overcomer sometime I don't want to be getting beat up all the time so I'm gonna pray for you in just a moment but just gonna sing a little bit to try to put